I'm so very pleased to have been invited to honor John Driscoll uh, this evening to offer the invocation. And his family would be the first ones to say that their dad was a man of prayer. They told me that he would get up uh, early before he went off to work to go to his place uh, of prayer. I call it, I guess it was the sun porch. And he would reflect on the scriptures and, and pray. And uh, after he died, the family looked in his, um, his uh, Bible, and he had a, a, a prayer of St. Saint, Saint Ignatius uh, that he prayed every day. And I'll conclude my invocation with that prayer, because it gives us an insight into the heart and soul of John Driscoll. So let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. God, our loving Father, as we gather to remember the rich life of Dr. John Driscoll, may we first honor his parents, Margaret and John, whose love for each other gave him life and whose deep faith planted the seed of God's life in the living waters of baptism a life that continued to mature into the person we have come to know and love and respect. A man whose life was not about himself, but one of service to others. Father, as we gather here this evening, bless Yvonne Driscoll, her children and grandchildren, the fruit of their 58 years together in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, until death. Bless his many colleagues and staff, workers, who have served with John over the years, bringing hope to countless parents as they slowly watch their little ones grow in health and life, and also to comfort those parents who left in sorrow. Bless Columbia University Medical Center and its men and women with wisdom and knowledge as they continue to bring your healing who are sick. Father, may this, prayer, this program this evening bring us to a deeper appreciation of the person of John Driscoll. And as we now pray the prayer of St. Ignatius, who, regular, who he regularly prayed uh, each day, give us a glimpse into John Driscoll. Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve as you serve, to give not to count the cost, to fight and to heed the wounds to toil and not to seek rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except of knowing that I have done your will. God, our Father, we ask that you reward John Manning Driscoll, your good and faithful servant who had a heart for the sick. Give him a place in your kingdom. Give him that place that you made for him at the very foundation of the world. And we confidently ask for all these requests because we pray in the names of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all together, God's people shout out, Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Father Papera, for those really wonderful words. Good afternoon, and thanks to everyone for joining us today as we celebrate the life of a truly extraordinary member of our Columbia community. For those of you I haven't met, my name's Katrina Armstrong. I'm the dean here at the Vagilis College, and so humbled to be co-hosting this celebration. While I did not have the honor of working with John Driscoll personally, his reputation and the stories that have come to me from so many people have shown me the extraordinary place that he holds in our hearts from colleagues to staff to so many of the families who he touched. Some of you I know in this room knew him in so many of those roles as your colleague, but also as the man who came to check in on your children and care for your families as they grew. As you know, Dr. Driscoll was a man of many accomplishments. He was an outstanding physician, caring for the youngest and the most vulnerable amount among us. And I think it's an apt tribute that the neonatal intensive care unit here bears his name. He was also a man of service, as we've heard, not only here at Columbia, but service to his country having earned the Bronze Star for his service in Vietnam, where he oversaw the construction of a new hospital, served over 300,000 Vietnamese civilians who previously had no medical care. He's truly a visionary leader. It was under his leadership as chair of the Department of Pediatrics that the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital was built, I know with our partners at New York Presbyterian. He was a valued colleague who understood the importance of teamwork and approached his work with both humility and tenacity. And I think, as I know from so many people here experienced it, he was an extraordinary mentor. He identified promising young pediatricians, researchers, and clinicians early in their careers and provided that magical guidance and support that allows them to flourish. I know some of those doctors and scientists who benefited from that are here with us today. I also know, as Father shared with us, that he was a man of extraordinary faith whose life of service and contributions were recognized by Pope John Paul II, who named him a Knight of Malta. And perhaps, even though I haven't had the pleasure of meeting his family before, I know that above all, he was a man of family, a man who treasured his family, and I'm so pleased that so many of members of his family could be with us today as we honor and celebrate his memory. So I want to say how grateful I am to have become a part of a community that he created that stands for all that he believed in and all that is right about our work as doctors and as carers, as healers and as leaders. And I'm looking forward to hearing our speakers remember those accomplishments as we celebrate him here today. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, someone who I know needs no introduction to this audience, Dr. Tom Morris, our alumni professor of clinical medicine. John Driscoll received his first academic appointment at Columbia in 1969. For the next 35 years, he and I were on parallel tracks at this medical center. He in pediatrics and neonatology and I in medicine and administration. However, I was well aware of his outstanding reputation as a, not only a pediatrician but a neonatologist and the expert care that he and his team provided in the neonatal intensive care unit. Unexpectedly, my family became the beneficiary of that care at one point, and our paths crossed a lot. Uh, without my prodding, John stepped in and scooped up the parents and grandparents, brought them to the isolate bedside, and gave them insight into the care that was needed, what the issues were, and what they should expect. He did that with compassion and care, thoughtfulness, and the family was greatly appreciated, appreciative of that. 
and the outcome was good, which was not expected when his team was at work. In a subsequent conversation uh, with Rich Poland, I learned by complete accident that John was an ardent Notre Dame football fan. <laughs> As an alumnus of Notre Dame, I had long sought to persuade some of my colleagues to go to a Notre Dame football game with me. Uh, most of them feared going outside the I-95 corridor. <laughs> However, I was able to persuade Steve Corwin at one point, and also Jerry Fishback to go to games with me. So I decided I'd pro I would approach John. Now, in my experience, John was very careful in his decision making. Deliberate, not slow to act, but careful. So I said to him one day, why don't we go to a Notre Dame football game together? Uh, to say that he responded quickly would be an understatement. <laughs> he leapt at the opportunity. So we went to lots of games together. Good weather, bad weather, good games, bad games. We developed a certain routine. We would meet in Chicago the night before the game and assemble our friends and family who were with us. And then we'd get in the car and drive two and a half hours to South Bend. Well, two and a half hours in the car with half a dozen people of all diverse backgrounds and interests led to outstanding conversations. And we all know John loved to talk. So he was right in the midst of it, whether it was law, business, politics, medical center events, it didn't matter. And then the routine on campus was pretty well set. We would go uh, to the grotto, say a prayer for the team. I never understood why Notre Dame lost because I thought John was hotwired to the God upstairs. <laughs> but then we would go to the game, have dinner, celebrate a little more, and then go back to Chicago. For us, every game was the Super Bowl. It was outstanding. And it brought enormous joy, not only to John, but also to me. And as we think about John today, we should keep in mind, this is a celebration of his life. And we should find the joy that he brought to us and where he uh, uh, had joy himself. I mentioned a couple of areas, uh, neonatology and football games. He would take amendment to that list and as the dean had pointed, pointed out, he would put faith and family at the top of his list. But whatever we put at our individual lists, keep in mind, John brought joy to life, and we should all try to find joy today. Thank you. Let me start by saying that John Driscoll was the, the most, the most um, what would I say, <clears throat> saintly person I ever met in my life or I ever will meet. <clears throat> and I mean this very seriously. If he, if he had not been an extraordinary physician, I'm sure he would have been an extraordinary priest. I was John's, um, uh, I guess I was his vice chairman or um, such, and uh, for the second half of his period, his period as chairman of the department, from 1998 until he retired, we got along wonderfully well Whenever we ran into any kind of a problem, like um, like um, uh, b budgets that simply didn't meet, or dreadful things happening on the wards, or simply insoluble problems, he would always say, John, you can always get an answer through faith. Just have faith. He loved his church. He loved the people within the church, the leadership of the church. He felt so proud of the church. And I, I was so taken by this and so respectful of it. And I can say that he, he was simply a spectacular leader 
because of his faith. Now, John knew that I was not a faith-based person. I was not a true believer in that sense. And the reason was that I had grown up in Canada and my great-grandmother's name was Wallace. She was, the, she was of the same family of, um, of, um, of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who with, with Darwin and with, um, and with uh, Huxley were the three leaders of the whole notion of mankind not being, not, being, not being essential in having a belief in a higher, a higher order. So I grew up in this, found, this very Darwinian atmosphere and um, uh, I, never, I never actually told John that it was because my, my family dated back to the, uh, the time of the uh, Wallaces but um, because I thought it was, I really just wanted to deal with John on, the, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and it, it's bad enough being a congenital non-believer. I didn't want to be known as a hereditary uh, non-believer. But um, at any rate, he, I knew that John felt very sorry for me, as if I was missing something very important uh, in, in terms of, of life, that is faith. And uh, he, one day he asked me, he said, John, why are you not a believer? And I said, well, just give me the evidence, and I will be a believer. Fast forward. Remember that awful day in January 2001, just before Christmas, it was in early December, when John was struck by a hit-and-run driver who left him on the, on the road to die. It was in the evening, a cold, dreadful evening. By the time I got to the emergency ward, he was uh, in desperate respiratory distress, and he was, they were just going to intubate him. But just before they intubated him, he saw me and he waved me over. He was gasping for breath. And he, he asked me that I get my ear down as close as possible, and he said three words. And these words were, the first one, the first one was budget. I knew he was fully compost mentos at that point, budget, because it was due in three days. I had to approach the dean with a terribly negative, uh, negative budget. It just was awful. So, but fortunately, the dean took passion uh, on me and, and passed it just like that. So, uh, at any rate, um, and his, but his, then he took my hand. He took my hand and he held it very, very firmly, more firmly than I could imagine was possible in someone so sick. And he whispered, held it up, and he, I put my ear down, and he said, his next two words were, God bless. God bless. And I had a remarkable feeling, as, as tears welled up in my eyes, I had a remarkable feeling that somehow he is passing his faith on to me. He was uploading his faith. And suddenly, I felt that I had faith. I, the ultimate non-believer, felt he had faith. The next uh, 11 days, he was on assisted ventilation. And for the rest of six months, he was really in and out of hospitals and out of care. And it was a, a, a very difficult period, a very difficult period for him. But seeing as somehow he had prepared me for it, being in his foots at that footsteps at that point, that everything went so smoothly, uh, it was just uncanny. Thanks, I might say a lot to uh, to to Peggy Dubner, uh, who was the uh, in charge of our of the office, and she just arranged everything so well. Everything went so very very smoothly, but then after six months, John started to come back two days a week, and then four days a week. 
And then slowly and painfully he came back to full time. But now, now he really had his own faith, the proof that I asked to see. When I had asked him, just give me the proof and I'll have faith, he now had the proof. And he became, a, he would, we would have our discussions and he could be a very persuasive, very persuasive uh, uh, um, um, believer in faith. And he never at any point dis displayed any, any anger towards the person who hit him in, the, in, the, uh, in that accident. He always said, it's probably somebody who's driving a truck or a bus and was utterly unaware of it. But he had his faith now and he could, he could, he could come from that point on Whenever I was with him and we were dealing with the problem, I had faith. I got the faith from him. It was magic. It was mir miraculous. I miss him desperately, as we all do. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Charlie Stoller, and I want to uh, thank you for daring me to limit my comments to five minutes. <laughs> I probably won't try. A reasonable person, and I apologize for reading this because I don't have a PowerPoint, so that's a struggle. <laughs> a reasonable person might ask, why is a surgeon speaking at a celebration for a neonatologist? A bit of framing, context, and some stories. First, there's a reason why this is called the College of Physicians and Surgeons. While we surgeons may think of ourselves as physicians who have completed the training, many of you would beg to differ, hence the distinction. Second, understand we pediatric surgeons are homeless orphans by the very nature of our passion. Today we would be considered unsheltered because I live in California, we are still woke. While our academic home is in the adult surgery department, adult surgeons have no idea what we do other than take care of small adults. We have no real interest, we pediatric surgeons have no real interest in adult disease. Our clinical home may be in the department of pediatrics, <clears throat> but be assured pediatricians are no better than wary of us. And as for neonatology, it's even more cloistered. When the NICU was on the 12th floor of babies, as we called it then, it was called the pole where the nurses would pee around the isolates to mark their territory, and the neonatologists would skitter when we showed up. Which brings us to December 20th, 1983. <clears throat> I had arrived a year or so earlier coming from what was then known as DC Children's, full of arrogance, fear, and knowing nothing. Peter Dillon and I had been experimenting upon 14 stem of the PNS buildings learning to support newborn lambs with an iteration of modified cardiopulmonary bypass designed for very long times, thinking at some point we might extrapolate this to a newborn human. Prior to this, the only worldwide anecdotal experience with newborns was reported at the University of Michigan and the Medical College of Virginia. That night, <clears throat> that night a newborn boy was transferred here emergently from Stanford, Connecticut with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. It's an unusual diagnosis which at the time had a very high mortality and there was no experience, anecdotal or otherwise, with visiting our lab work on such an infant. I was on call and repaired the infant's defect as an emergency. That was the standard then. His post-op course was initially reasonable but rapidly deteriorated after a few hours such that death was imminent. The parents asked about donating the son's organs for transplant. At that point, I had the nerve to bring up our lab work as a possible resource. Horror ensued. The neonatologists were paralyzed by angst. The nurses were in an uproar because there was no policy and procedure in the documentation in the books. Administration was in a state because there's not even an IRB application. This was nuts. They were contorted by the specter of surgeons doing uncontrolled stuff. Neither Jim Mom or Fred Bowman wanted to hear about it. Keith Reinsmith said, just do it. Peter Altman thought we were putting in a Broviac. 
None of the devices have been approved for human use. We made tubing circuits and cannulas ourselves with super glue and cut chest tubes. The stuff was mounted on a decrepit, battered three-wheel cafeteria cart with paper cups attached for disposables and lamb's wool scattered all about. We actually prepped this baby with woolite instead of betadine. Henry Spotness had discarded the roller pump because there were no spare parts. Nevertheless, John Driscoll, who had been to our lab and was aware of what we were up to, huddled briefly in the corner with L. Stanley James and Jen Tian Wong and said, OK, write an honest consent, show it to me, and let's go speak with the parents. For reasons I'll never understand, the parents agreed, and we did it. And this kid is now a 39-year-old editor of the Raleigh Durham, <coughs> excuse me, Raleigh Durham uh, newspaper. He's married with two kids. Some of the nurses who took care of him might actually be here today. There's absolutely no question in my mind that this young man is a thriving, contributing member of society today because of John. No question. John had the strength of character, courage, or perhaps instantly insanity, rather, to trust me in the face of substantial skepticism. He had the intuition and understanding to explain his endorsement to nursing, neonatologists, despite the anxiety in the room. This is just how John was, never judgmental, always honest, zero tolerance for bullshit. John also regularly did something senior faculty seldom do for junior faculty. He would ask me simply, what do you think? He listened. He validated. We both learned. He took me seriously. He embraced that although we were hard-bitten surgeons, we were all on the same page, <clears throat> advocating for the best interests of children and their families. John knew there were only two kinds of kids, healthy and less than healthy, period. He also knew there was only one kind of person in the room, only those that actively cared for the less than healthy, each in his own way. Who you were, where you came from, what you believed, what you represented was irrelevant. That he supported a loudmouthed, opinionated jerk like me stipulated to his prescient embrace of diversity equity and inclusion before that came the tone of the day. Because of this and so many more interactions, no wonder the NICU was my most comfortable venue. His mean, his aura, his persona set the standard and permeated the entire fabric of the neonatology from housekeeping to administration to the superb nursing staff he referred to as the Golden Girls <clears throat> and the then neonatologists including Tova Rosen, Carl Schultz, Buddy Stark, and Suda Kashyap. All of us were touched by his humanity. Said another way, we all wanted to be like him. His humanity permeated his large family as well. Yvonne's concern, resourcefulness, <coughs> excuse me, and care when developmental concerns emerged with our son, they were palpable. Their son Kevin, is Kevin here today? The Mets still suck, I'm sorry. <laughs> Their son, Kevin, and my father's uh, mutual harassment over the Mets versus the St. Louis Cardinals oozed the warmth you'd expect. I still have those letters, Kevin. On a personal note, I'll share with you <coughs> that our granddaughter, excuse me, our granddaughter, Rosie, who now has COVID for the seventh time, but she's okay. Our granddaughter, Rosie, was born at an Eastside hospital that shall not be named with an APGAR of zero in the depths of COVID. <coughs> That she's now a feisty three-year-old, almost three-year-old, is because the way she was resuscitated is a direct consequence of the novel strategy developed in our neonatal unit led by John and Jen Tian Wong and others, and also in the face of considerable skepticism. I'll share another story, this one about how John looked out for me again. The details are not important, but some infant was coming apart at the seams despite all sorts of surgery. Self-reprobation is something all surgeons experience but never talk about. I was considerably more agitated than usual. John recognized it when he pulled me aside and in his kindly but direct way said, Charlie, if you don't calm down, you're going nowhere. You didn't give the baby his woes. You just tried to fix him. I calmed down for a while, but I think about that wise counsel repeatedly. I'll never, uh, I will forever be grateful for the support John gave me in my transition to the pediatric surgery chief. And during his tenure, his and Eric Rose's support to help us navigate a Woolley Hospital organizational structure securing best possible resources. 
Just like the first encounter, he took me and us seriously because we were all on the same page. <clears throat> After 31 years, I've been away from Columbia for 10 years now. I really miss it. The struggles and peregrinations notwithstanding, I have nothing but the fondest of memories. These were truly halcyon days. John was the emblem of those days. I remember others as babies, Welton Gersney, Sergio Piamelli, Bob Mellons, Walter Burden, all who shared John's curiosity, not hesitating to ask, what do you think? But John was a role model for all. His was the role model for giving us pediatric surgical orphans a home. My colleagues from the then times, Steve Stilianos, Jeff Zeisman, Bill Middlesworth, I'm sure they're all nodding in agreement. There's much more to share, but I've run out of my time, so I'll just close with this. A number of years later, I asked John, why did he let us do what we did on December 20th, 1983? And we've heard a lot about this from previous speakers. He said it because he was a man of faith. He had faith. Knowing the seriousness with which John took his belief system, I have some idea as to what he meant by faith. By faith, he did not mean in me, us, anyone, or anything. He meant faith in that which, in his worldview, guided him. Well, whoever, whatever, however, brought that worldview and John to us and guided him, I, all of us, and the children and families he touched are eternally grateful. And we honor his faith by perpetuating what he showed us. Thank you. Julian Barnes uh, wrote in his book, Levels of Life Upon Loss and Death, it's worth as much as you think of it. And it's worth rem remembering with John that his loss was a priceless loss, that there was an element to John that was pure grace and pure devotion. There would not be a Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital without John. Not just because of the vision that we all had about how this needed to be built and how an aging baby's hospital needed to be replaced, but because of the families and the children that believed in John, the community of Columbia and New York Presbyterian then Columbia Presbyterian believed in John. And it really is a tribute to him that we still call uh, Baby Central, Baby Central, and Babies North, because it will always be Baby's Hospital to those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s. The fact of the matter is that John was somebody whom we could all rely on in a pinch. He was the first president of the New York Presbyterian Medical Board. So if you think dealing just with Columbia faculty is a problem, uh, think about dealing with two faculties who, at the time, didn't really think that they wanted to get along with each other. John was a calming influence. John was able to see the bigger picture. John was able to pull people together where they didn't think they could be pulled together. As a physician, he was unparalleled. He and Yvonne, the neonatology unit, um, really extraordinary care in very difficult circumstances. Uh, those of you who've been around long enough remember the decrepit state of that hospital before the new hospital was built, and yet the care was simply extraordinary. Simply extraordinary. And he was somebody you could always count on in any situation, as everyone here knows. I see so many people uh, that I haven't seen in over probably three or four years since COVID, but we all came together for this. Because it's the memories that sustain us, and it's the memories of being together that sustain us, and it's the memories of John that will sustain Yvonne, your family, because he was truly somebody that we all admired. You know, it's hard to work in a place for 40 plus years and be liked by everybody. 
I can tell you that. <laughs> but he was liked by everybody. And he was somebody that everyone looked up to. I remember those days that uh, John was in the surgical ICU. And it was one of those times when the entire institution rallies around a person and rallies around hoping and praying that that person will get well. Um, and it was truly extraordinary what he went through to get back to a semblance of life. But it was also truly extraordinary as to how the entire institution came together. For all of the bickering that we do amongst ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, what truly makes this place unique is that sense, as Charlie Stoller said, that we are a family. And we may argue around the dinner table, but in times of stress and duress, we come together, we pray for each other, we help each other, we lift each other up. I can tell you there were any number of times in my career uh, where John gave me advice that I took to heart and made a difference in terms of the way that I approach things. Uh, I'm not somebody who is necessarily calm by nature, as most of you know, but John was a calming influence on me. He was even a calming influence on Mike Chelansky, who I see here today. So. Because John had that way about him. He was grace personified and somebody I will truly miss. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm reading this for Dr. Dodi Meyer, who couldn't be here today, but I'm happy to read it for her. Dear Yvonne, Anne, John, Kevin, Billy, Margaret, and Michael, thank you for asking me to speak at this event and to honor this giant of a man, Dr. John Driscoll, or Dr. D, as we all call him in this department. I am truly sorry that I can't do this in person, but I am far away on a leave planned a long time ago, and my words are well represented by a mutual friend and colleague, Peggy Dubner. That's me. <laughs> In some strange way, our families are bound together by love and loss, by friendship and grief. The two men that bind us together are no longer here, but their souls are present in our lives and in the life of this institution that was so near and dear to their hearts. My late husband, Dr. Steve Miller, and Dr. John Driscoll forged over the years an incredibly strong bond. It started as an employer-employee relationship one that was special to Dr. D, as Steve was his first hire, developed into a teacher-student relationship, then a mentor-mentee relationship, and eventually into a profound friendship. This bond was one that is not easy to forge and sustain in the intense and stressful academic environment like ours. The beauty of such a relationship is that it doesn't just benefit the two people involved, but also shines a light to others and serves as a model for those around them. Dr. D, of course, was a unique man. He had the wonderful capacity to lead with determination, but with a very gentle demeanor, to be a towering figure, but never an intimidating one, to be an authoritative leader that never inspired fear, a unique thinker who was truly interested in other people's thoughts, someone who trusted his faculty, and above all, someone who led with a true moral compass. On a day-to-day -day basis, Dr. D was never in a hurry to judge others. He navigated our extremely complex political environment with elegance, dignity, and a lot of patience. He always kept the focus on our mission to provide the best care to all who needed it while caring for each other in the process. Dr. Driscoll exuded a warmth in every encounter. He opened himself to true and honest dialogue, opened his beautiful home every year to receive the residents and faculty, and had an office available to all of us who needed his time, advice, thinking, and guidance. In December of 2001, 
Dr. D suffered a horrible hit and run accident. I still remember when the call came in with the news and Steve immediately rushed to see if there was anything he could do for him and his family. That first day and that first month was a long one, all of us holding our breath, listening for news of his daily progress. Steve was honored to be able to spend a lot of time with all of you. He wanted nothing but to be by his side and your sides. Steve and I wished that there was something we could have done to absorb your pain during that difficult time. There is a special bond that is born out of shared pain. It is when we human beings are able to meet each other with no pretension, when we are willing to openly share our vulnerabilities, when we hold each other closely as we face the randomness of life and the unknown it brings. The same way I remember exactly where I was when the call came to let us know of Dr. D's accident, I of course remember exactly where I was standing when I first spoke to Dr. D after Steve's death. We spoke over the phone and I told him that I would very much like to see him. I remember him walking through our door, a sad but warm loving smile, present with his strong hug and his calm listening. Even though those first few days remain a blur for me, I vividly remember him sitting in our study and his voice and presence acting as a bomb to my raw pain. After those, after those first few weeks, Dr. D and Mary Sonnet came to my house almost on a weekly basis to be with me, give me solace, and accompany me in my grief. Dr. D also made sure to come during school hours as not to interrupt my time with the kids. We spoke a lot about death, of course. He, a religious Irish Catholic, and me, a pretty reformed Jew. Our theologies didn't coincide much, but our spirituality and our acknowledgement of a God did. I remember him saying in his soft, candid voice that he truly believed he would reunite with his sister and parents after his death, and how that gave him much comfort. I, on the other hand, had to contend with my suffering as I had no afterlife as a consolation. These visits were remarkable and as he shared later with me, truly showed the different stages of loss that I was going through. Here was a father, mentor, figure for both Steve and me taking time amid extremely important responsibilities and an impossibly busy schedule to bring comfort to one of his faculty members, sharing with me not only his wisdom, but illuminating through his presence, his close bond with Steve. During those hours, I not only had him, but also Steve in the room. My father, Rabbi Marshall Meyer wrote, memory is humankind's faculty to treasure. In the corner of one's mind, the smiles, glances, tears, suffering, and love that form the celebration of the past. Memory can be the force that propels us into new dimensions of living and loving, a new future heretofore unknown. Memory is the arsenal of glories lived and lost, of unrealized dreams, of, of securities and insecurities, of ingenuousness untrammeled. Memory is also a living bridge where past and present fuse transforming the future if one can find the strength to do battle with the powers that maintain the status quo. After loss and after grief, we all eventually learn to live with the pain and very slowly transform that pain into gratitude for the life that was. We incorporate our loved ones into our lives, our values, our hopes, our children, our futures, and thus we ensure their immortality. Dr. Driscoll is one of those men whose essence will live in the life of many, transforming us all for many generations to come. And I am so ever grateful for his life. And I am too, and I know we all are.
Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm uh, John uh, Manning Driscoll III, my father's namesake uh, and eldest son. Um, and on behalf of uh, all of my uh, siblings, Anne, Bill, uh, Margaret, Kevin, uh, Michael, our spouses, uh, the Driscoll grandchildren, uh, and most important, uh, our mother Yvonne, uh, the other Dr. Driscoll. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Armstrong, uh, uh, Dr. Corwin, Dr. Orange, uh, and their teams for organizing this, uh, this celebration of our father. Um, we'd also like to thank Dr. Morris, uh, Dr. Truman, uh, Dr. Stoller, uh, and Dodie Meyer um, for their very generous remarks uh, and uh, their years of friendship to, uh, to our father. Um, and then <clears throat> we'd like to thank as well Father Prepara, uh, a decades-long friend uh, of our father and our family, uh, and Peggy Dubner uh, uh, for reading Dodie's remarks uh, and for being my father's indispensable partner uh, for these many years. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for being here today um, and for, for joining us in the celebration of our father's life. Um, I'd like to give you a sense of, uh, of the broad outlines of my father's life. Um, he was born in 1937 to John Manning Driscoll, uh, the original, uh, and Margaret O'Donohue Driscoll, uh, who herself grew up right here in Washington Heights. Um, uh, his father was the, the chief uh, mechanical engineer at Con Ed, uh, and his mother was a New York City school teacher. Uh, he had three siblings, uh, Mary, Peter, and Sheila, uh, who he loved very much. He went to the local Catholic schools and graduated from St. Mary's High School in Manhasset, <clears throat> uh, where he uh, excelled in the classroom and out. Uh, he went on to Hamilton College, uh, which he loved, where he excelled there as well, uh, particularly outside the classroom, where he uh, captained the basketball and lacrosse teams. Uh, he then went on to Wake Forest Medical School um, with a push from a venerable college dean uh, and my father's uh, sort of self-deprecating uh, uh, version of the events. The dean called in a favor to get him admitted. Um, after graduating, uh, he interned at Pittsburgh Children's uh, where he met our mother, uh, who was also an intern. Um, and uh, the next stop was Washington, uh, D.C., uh, serving his commitment to the Navy for funding his medical school, uh, service that included in 1966 a tour in Vietnam. Uh, his tour coincided with my birth, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, which meant my mother uh, had uh, a newborn and a one-year-old, uh, my sister Anne, uh, on top of uh, her job then as a chief resident. Um, he, when he left the Navy as a decorated lieutenant commander, um, he joined the House staff shortly thereafter at, uh, at Columbia and at the staff of uh, Baby's Hospital, um, where he would spend four decades. Um, during that time, he and my mother raised uh, six children, um, welcomed six spouses, um, and loved uh, 16 grandchildren. Um, that's a lot in one life. Um, but as we've heard here today, there is so much more. Uh, uh, the essence <clears throat> of my father was this, in my humble view. He was a, a very, very good man. Um, he was a good husband, a good father, a good grandfather. He was a good son, a good brother, a good uncle. He was a good doctor, a good teacher, a good colleague. He was a good friend, a good mentor, a good servant. Each of those roles meant something special and very important to him. And he took them all very seriously, even if he didn't take himself all that seriously. He understood and welcomed the obligations, the unique obligations that came with each of those roles. And he did his best every day to live up to the best version of that role. He was a paragon in so many ways, 
modeling for those who cared to notice how to live well, how to serve others. When I think about him, what he did and how he did it, I'm humbled and amazed. Um, he enriched so many lives and cared for so many of us. <clears throat> he somehow seemed to keep several worlds spinning at once. Um, our large and energetic Irish Catholic family, uh, six kids in the span of 10 years, um, our massive extended family uh, and his many, many friends, uh, his church, his local community, a division and then a department at Columbia, and uh, patients and families that came along with that. And his professional community, <clears throat> experienced doctors, young doctors, staff, and nurses, who he had a very special respect for. Um, it was hard work for sure, um, uh, work that would uh, easily hobble me or some other normal person. But he did it, and he did it well, I think, because he cared about people, about us. Uh, he was curious about us, about our stories, about our plans, and most important, he was inclined to see the best in us. Columbia, the hospital, the medical school, was a huge part of my father's life, uh, and it was a big part of our lives, too. Um, my mother uh, was on the clinical staff for years, running the medical follow-up program for the NICU. He also shared his life at Columbia with us. He took us to work with him, uh, a proto uh, bring your children to work day. Um, we met his colleagues. Um, we roamed the halls of the medical center. We watched him work in the NICU on 12 north of Old Babies Hospital. Uh, and we later met the doctors, residents, administrators, and nurses <clears throat> at the larger Babies Hospital and later the Children's Hospital of New York. He seemed to know everyone, not just their names, but the details. Um, uh, a favorite team, uh, children's names, the sports they played, recent successes, sicknesses in the family. Um, we saw that when he spoke with people, <clears throat> He really listened. He focused. He cared. And he loved his work. Sure, it was frustrating and maddening at times. Like all top-tier institutions, this venerable hospital can sometimes be a place of sharp elbows and big egos. <clears throat> but somehow, my father seemed to manage his way around and through that and still remain persistently optimistic um, and to even be loved by those around him. I expect it was because he naturally cared, uh, cared so much about, uh, about this place, and he cared uh, about the least glamorous parts of the job. Uh, taking the time to really listen, finding ways he could best serve his colleagues, the children and the families, focusing on the people, patients, parents, doctors and staff. He had the, the very good fortune to understand how much he was loved at Columbia because the institution uh, graciously celebrated his retirement with multiple events. Uh, he forced himself to sit through the tributes, denied that they were accurate, <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, uh, felt, I think, an immense sense of pride. Um, but really, uh, he radiated gratitude gratitude for the opportunities that he had. I think most of all, when he spoke at those events, um, he'd center, center his talks on my mother. He would say that she was the reason he was able to do everything he did, that she was his partner. Um, he'd say that she was the better doctor, uh, the one he learned from the most, he would recognize the sacrifices she made. He would say <clears throat> that she was the love of, his, love of his life and the thing that made his life most meaningful. And it's true. They made each other better people. They were each other's biggest fans and honest critics. Um, they shared a vision of the world, a commitment to their faith, a robust sense of obligation to serve others, and an immense love of children. 
Now, I'd like to channel some of that gratitude now uh, and, uh, and, and thank uh, uh, all of you for being my father's colleagues, for being his friends, for sharing your lives with him <coughs> and with us, and for making his work meaningful, and for sharing in his effort to serve, truly serve, everyone that this great hospital ministers to. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Jordan Orange. I'm the uh, 10th chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Columbia. And in some ways, I have um, the least right to be on this stage. I did get to know Dr. Driscoll. I did get to receive counsel and advice from him as I was starting. I did get to um, experience the profound pain that everyone felt as he had his stroke and was cared for in our neural ICU. It's as if um, I come into the film at the very end when the credits are beginning to roll. But on the same vein, with uh, so many here in this room, I share in the tremendous and profound responsibility of advancing the legacy and mission of John Driscoll. And I know that that's something that um, so many of us are tremendously honored and delighted to be able to do. I've learned so much of John Driscoll's life, work, and impact. I have his papers. I look through them. I read them. I read his memos. I read the care and the love that he has poured into this institution and making it possible. And as uh, Steve Corwin once said earlier, um, when reflecting, he's not sure that this place would exist uh, were it not for John Driscoll. So to get back um, to John's comments, uh, it's with profound gratitude. I think that we all carry this forward. And I would invite everyone to um, someday pass by the offices of the department where we have our John Driscoll entry and a wonderful, almost life-size portrait of Dr. Driscoll. And um, walk into the office and say, morning, John. What are we going to do today? So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, for attending and to uh, join us in the lobby for some uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, fellowship, and reception. Thank you.